to start with we have dr satyan p he's a renowned glaucoma specialist from coimbatore satyan will be talking to us on gonioscopy over to you satyan uh, very good morning to all of you thank you ksos for this opportunity to be here uh, doing the gonioscopy is basically an attitude that we have to have so gonioscopy in uh, ophthalmology is very essential it can help your uh, diagnosis it's useful for your therapeutic option and also to assess the prognosis when you're looking at the anterior chamber angle most of the time it is for the medical management on for the surgical procedure the anterior chamber angle is critical looking at the anatomy of the anterior chamber angle from anterior to posterior you have the small base line then you have the non uh, pigmented trabecular meshwork then you have the pigmented trabecular meshwork then you have the scleral spur then you have the ciliary body band if you don't know this then there is no point in you doing the gonioscopy so this is very essential and critical so doing the gonioscopy so we know that the gonioscopic status is a very uh, you know very dynamic one it is not static as there is a lens changes medication effects aging process and the disease process all these things can alter the gonioscopic uh, picture over a period of time so there are two different methods what we commonly do in the opd is the indirect gonioscopy and what we do in the operating room is the direct gonioscopy so in the indirect gonioscopy we just have to understand this it's a mirror image whatever you see in the mirror is the opposite side but the side is not reversed right is right and left is left this is more, many times we have this confusion so this is again critical for us to understand this basics so in the indirect method there, there are different type of lenses are available one is with the flange the other is without the flange so what is this is all about the one with the flange you need to use the coupling solution the viscoelastic solution as the radius of the curvature of the lens is smaller than the radius of the curvature of the cornea so you have to use this uh, viscoelastic solution you can see the flange in this then the other one is you can see the radius of the curvature is about 8.4 which is much more than the corneal curvature in this you don't have to really use the viscoelastic solutions both the lenses can be comfortably used but if we want to do the recording purpose then it is better we go for the the one which has the viscoelastic solution that is with the flange so in whenever you are doing the indirect gonioscopy in the slit lamp what are the prerequisites it is optional that if you want to have on handheld hand i mean the rest uh, you can use it then of course you need to have your uh, viscoelastic gel the gonio gel solution then you need to have the uh, local anesthetic agents then the type of lens which you want to use it the indirect lenses of uh, your choice uh, by but basically i use a slt lens which gives you a much better view than your regular gonioscopy lenses then of course you can use your uh, the handheld lens also whichever is your option you can always uh, take it and use it and of course you have to have the tissue papers for yourself for the staff and for the patient as we know that it is going to leak over there these are very practical things so the first step is you fill up your uh, the gonio gel in your lens and make sure that there is not much of a air bubble that is the critical one if you have the air bubble the visualization of your angle becomes very difficult so make sure that there is no air bubble that is the step number 1 then the next step is uh, applying the local anesthetic i basically use a propracaine 0.5 percentage one drop then wait for just 15 seconds to 30 seconds for it to numb and then the next step is preparing your patient for the slit lamp examination so make sure that the patient is sitting comfortably without much of a head tilt and ask the patient to look up that is going to be adjust your uh, uh, slit lamp make it comfortable probably you just turn your slit lamp to the temporal side about uh, 60 degrees so the angle is very comfortably visible for you when you are taking the ask the patient to look up that is very important and just make sure that you see the the lower part of the sclera comfortably and then just push it in and then rotate the lens so the mirror is on the top the reason is 
the, the, uh, the broadest or the widest angle is the inferior angle, so start seeing the inferior angle first. Then once the procedure is over, then how to take out the lens out. Ask the patient to gently close the lids or sometimes a little bit more so that there is a vacuum created inside, the air bubble goes in, then easily it comes out. That's how you, so this is how usually the angles are. The lower part is the widest angle, so you can comfortably see the narrowest is the upper part. Then if you take a typical angle closer disease, usually the narrowest is on the temporal side. So this is how you start seeing, the moment you put the slit, the slit is, height is more. So immediately you just reduce the height and also switch out the uh, lights in the room so that the room becomes a little bit darker. You don't have to really completely darken it. And then starts widen the slit. It is the height of the slit is reduced to the minimum and widen the slit you can see comfortably and also increase the magnification. The first step is to see that the wedge, the corneal wedge is the first thing that you should look for so that you don't misidentify the Swalby's line as a trabecular measure. That is the first part. So this is how you start seeing the, the lower angle first, the inferior angle first, and then nasal, inferior, and then comes to the temporal. So you can use the other lens, the handheld lens also you can use it. You don't need a gonial gel in this, but I'm not too happy to do this because you don't see much angle structures in this as good as what you see with your single or two mirror lenses. So this is how you hold, but a little bit of a cross angle, you hold it, then you can see the angle much better than holding it like a plus. So this is how you can do it. So anatomy recap, Swalby's line, trabecular meshwork, scleral spur, and the ciliary body band. So I just thought I'll share you some of the pathologies in each area. Swalby's line, if you say, how to identify the Swalby's line, as I told you, you can see these two slits here, one in the front and one in the back. Where it joins is the corneal wedge, that is the end of the decimates, that is where the Swalby's line starts. So first thing is you identify the Swalby's line so that you don't miss the pigmented Swalby's line as a trabecular meshwork. So many people used to say that they had done a, 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 I mean, or SLT, but they might have done it only in the Swalby's line. So this is the Swalby's line, pigmented Swalby's line, otherwise called as a sampleysis line in a pseudo exfoliation glaucoma. Then you have the trabecular meshwork, you can see that this is a uniform 360 degree pigmentation of the trabecular meshwork that is a very typical of uh, uh, pigment dispersion syndrome. So you should not get confused with the sampleysis line and the pigmented trabecular meshwork. Usually the trabecular pigmented meshwork is, meshwork is very irregular in pigmentation and it is rough. In children it is very uh, lightly pigmented or sometimes it is very glistening. It is not like a very pigmented layer. Then comes the Swalby's, I mean, scleral spur. This is a very white band there. This is a very critical structure in the anterior chamber angle to decide most of the other areas. So scleral spur is extremely important, especially when you're doing the OCT, the scleral spur is important. So you can see here, over the scleral spur, you can see the blood and also the NVA in the angle with a little bit of a high femur over there. Iris and ciliary body. Then you have the, mainly you have to understand this iris processes this is a filiform like vessel like pattern, brownish in color. This will not obstruct the flow. But when you see the PIS, you can see how broad it is. It is broader, but it obstructs the outflow. So these are the two main things that we need to understand. Iris processes and the PIS, how to identify and what happens. The next one is on the, this is a traumatic midriasis. You can see that ciliary body band, how wide the ciliary body band is, pigmented trabecular meshwork, then you have the ciliary body band over there, how wide it is. So it is a dark grayish band, large area of the ciliary body band. This is a typical angle recession glaucoma. So manipulation gonioscopy, there's a small one on this. So you, when you are asking the patient to look up, then you can see that the angle widens. Towards the mirror, you ask the patient to see towards the mirror, then angle opens up a little bit, so that is called as the manipulation gonioscopy. In post-operative conditions, the gonioscopy is, again, very, very useful. You can see this is the ostium. You can see the two pillars on that iris, which is coming into the clogging the ostium, but it is not completely clogging the ostium, so it is quite useful for you to understand what is going on over there. You can see this is a pseudo-exfoliation glaucoma where I have done a trabeclectomy, uh, but you can see very, little hyphema, which I missed, 
uh, but when you can see the ostium, it is oozing from the ostium. Both the sides of the ostium, it is oozing from there. So that is very typical of uh, pseudo-exfoliation glaucoma patients. And this is a, again post-trap ostium. This is open. Only a few pigments are there. So the cause is not from the ostium. It is somewhere else. The problem is from somewhere else. So I'll just take one uh, few 10 seconds I'll take. So you can see in this again, the ostium is completely clogged by the uh, iris. So again, the cause of failure, we can easily understand and identify and treat the cause. So goniascopy is again an attitude that we have to develop to diagnose our therapeutic options based on that. You can use it for uh, prognostic as well. So thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Satin. That was a master class. I have a question for you. Uh, yeah, in an inflamed eye, let me say it's a post vitrectomy eye with oil. The patient has had a shallow AC. A YAC PA was done. The AC is formed, but still the IOP remains high. In such a condition, what gonioscopy would you advise? See, as long as your cardia is clear, you can use anything. All gonioscopes, provided that you are comfortable in using the one which has a flange. Because with the flange, your visualization is always better. But without the flange, you can use in those kind of uh, complicated conditions, you can use those with the radius of curvature is much larger. So that will be very comfortable for the patient and for you also. Though it's inflamed eyes, it is better to use without gel. Handheld, you can use it, or you can use the modified the Goldman also. You can use it with a single or two mirrors, you can use it, definitely. This emulsified oil particles in the trabecular muscle will look, uh, how will it look? It will so that is a very fancy video. I do have one because that is obviously seen. So these things which we really don't see with your naked eyes or in a slit lamp is the one which I really wanted to show in this. But that is a very fancy picture. We always try to show the angle foreign body. Of course, small angle foreign bodies, definitely gonioscopy is important. But silicon oil is always seen in uh, slit lamps comfortably. Then you don't really have to use a gonioscopy to pick up the silicon oil. Those kind of very tiny silicon oil uh, bubbles in the angle it really may not be the cause for the increased intraocular pressures. It is uh, more of a tight band or something else is the cause. Yeah. Any question from the audience? Uh, if not, we can go to the... Yeah. Uh, thanks so much again. Thank you. And Thank uh, you. Thank I you. repeatedly say this uh -huh. word all the time. Doing a gonioscopy is an attitude. Please do develop that. Thank you. Thank you, sir.